So good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Australiana Fund's third Narrative of Nations Symposium and the second lecture in this online Zoom lecture series. Uh, my name is Sonia Abbey. I'm the Australiana Fund's Fine Art Advisor. And before we begin, I'd like to note this lecture is being recorded and I hope to have it um, online at the end of the symposium series um, for you to rewatch or pass on to friends and relatives you think may be interested. Um, to enhance your viewing tonight, it's best that you put your Zoom screen to speaker view, which will allow you to see our speaker and the PowerPoint presentation. Um, we ask you to please keep yourself on mute until the end, um, until the lecture is completely finished. As many of the presentations in this series, series could be dense with images, there may be at times a delay in moving to the next slide or potentially other technical difficulties. We're aiming to provide the best experience for you tonight as the internet allows. Um, and if you would like to ask any questions during the talk, please send them through via the chat button, which is, should be at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try and answer as many of those as possible at the end of the lecture. I'll now hand over to Jennifer Sanders, Chair of the Australiana Fund. Uh, thank you very much, Sonia, and welcome everybody. It's great to see all of these names up on the screen of people joining in for what is our second online lecture from the Narratives of Nations Symposium that unfortunately we had to postpone last year. Before we begin tonight, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land from which I am Zooming this evening. I would also like to pay respect to their elders, past, present and future, and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians present. So tonight we are very fortunate to have Margaret Betteridge presenting her lecture Ruth Lane Poole, A Woman of Influence. It's going to be fascinating and she has got some really wonderful um, images for us. And really after the cancellation of the symposium, not only could we not meet together in Canberra to hear these lectures in person, we also couldn't see the wonderful exhibition that Margaret Betteridge curated for the Canberra Museum and Gallery on Ruth Lane Poole. She does have some images from that exhibition. And I know that the CMAG has online an introduction to that exhibition, but tonight will really bring to life for you the story of Ruth Lane Poole. Margaret Betteridge is a freelance heritage and decorative arts consultant and a director of Betteridge Heritage, a postgraduate scholar in museum studies at the University of Leicester, Margaret was founding curator of the Royal Mint and Hyde Park Barracks Museums for Sydney's Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences. And that's where I met her. In fact, she was very important for my curatorial career. In 1986, she was appointed to the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet to manage the collections of contents in the Australian government's official residences. Since 1994, Margaret has enjoyed the diversity of collections management and curatorial enterprise projects with clients ranging from all tiers of government as well as the public domain and private commissions. Mm -hmm. She has experience working on projects across Australia and New Zealand and I know she delivers award-winning results. Her clients include the New South Wales government, Public Works Advisory, Property Development and Heritage New South Wales, as well as the City of Sydney and Sydney Living Museums. Margaret is passionate about the use of Australian flora and its adaptation as a decorative language in design, art and craft. And Margaret is passionate about Ruth Lane Poole. And we are very fortunate to hear from Margaret tonight, speaking about a woman who had an enormous influence in Canberra, and that will come to light here in Margaret's talk. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, and welcome everybody to tonight's presentation. I'm speaking to you from Bidjigal and Gadigal land uh, in Randwick in Sydney, and I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Before I begin, I'd like to also acknowledge uh, the assistance of the Canberra Museum and Gallery 
who took on a suggestion that we might uh, mount an exhibition on the work of Ruth Lane Poole, whose connection with Canberra was significant in the 1920s. And I was assisted um, very generously in that by Harriet Elvin, uh, who is a member of the fund, Dr. Sarah Schmidt, and Rowan Henderson, who coordinated the, uh, the actual design and set up of the exhibition. Um, it was such a shame that after two years of research, we weren't able to actually see the exhibition in person. But as Jennifer said, it's available to see online. And I'll post at the end of the lecture the links um, that you can um, follow to access the exhibition. I had received an enormous amount of assistance from Jennifer and Sonia uh, at the fund in developing and preparing the exhibition and from the staff of Government House and the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet who very generously arranged for items from the houses that had never been really seen in this context in the public domain before. So it was a shame that that opportunity was missed um, as well. I'm very grateful to Ruth's grandchildren, uh, Susie Murdoch, Caroline Hassing and Ned Hamilton, who filled in so many gaps in the story I knew about Ruth and added personal uh, reminiscences and very generously shared um, items of their own personal um, family history. And I also received a lot of help from Dr. John de Garvel in Melbourne, who had been a, a great advocate for the work of Charles Lane Poole. He was a forester. Uh, himself and he directed me to many sources that were really useful um, in the story of Ruth's husband, Charles Lampool. All the institutions in Canberra helped too, um, the National Library, the National Archives, the National Gallery, um, Australian National University, and they were all very generous in lending um, material to the exhibition. And finally, I'd really like to acknowledge Susan Witherkin and Dr. Nanor Coulthard and Greg Peters, because each of those people had done research on Ruth in various areas and gave me a fantastic platform to build on. So uh, let's get on with the story of Ruth Lane Poole, a woman of influence, and I'm sure you'll enjoy the journey um, to learn more about her. So the next slide, Sonia, please. As Jennifer said, I worked as the advisor, fine arts and gifts to the, in the department of the prime minister of cabinet. Um, I joined in 1986. And at that particular point in time, the lodge was about to commence a conservation management plan with the assistance of the official establishments trust. And this was a wonderful opportunity to research the history of the building. And as it turned out, to include the contents of the building as integral to the significance of the lodge as, as an official residence. Um, in the next slide, um, I just wanted to mention the uh, inspiration uh, that um, Mrs. Hazel Hulk, who was patron of the fund at the time, um, and the absolute joy of working with her on the project um, where we learned so much about Ruth and her contribution. But it was Hazel's love of music and um, her passion for history that really set me off on my life journey um, to get to know Ruth. Hazel had come to Canberra um, as the wife of the Prime Minister and discovered that there had been a piano in the lodge and she wanted to find out more about it. We discovered that it had been lent by a former occupant to the Canberra Conservatorium of Music where it was being used as a practice piano. So we went and had a look at it. It was in very poor condition, but it was an Australian made Beale piano, um, a, a very high quality. 
but conscious that the taxpayer would perhaps not welcome an expenditure on the restoration of a piano, we hatched a plan to uh, use the skills of the staff and students at the Peran College of Advanced Education in Melbourne, which ran a piano technology course. So the piano went down there where Wayne Stewart, who's represented in the funds collection with the piano um, he made of Australian Timbers um, at Admiralty House in Sydney. And it was almost a year, I think, um, that it took to restore the piano. And when it arrived back in Canberra and was installed in the lodge, um, Hazel invited the students and Wayne up to Canberra for a morning tea, and she gave them the first recital um, on the newly restored piano. But that small project opened a door that has consumed my research for um, the years, the intervening years, um, and, and continues. And I'll explain a little bit about some of the new research um, that I've been doing since the exhibition. Um, so in the next slide, um, I thought I should just explain that there were remnants that we could see of some of the 1927, 26, 27 furniture in the house. But it had lost a lot of its context. Um, and one of the ways that we felt uh, we should start the research was to see what photographs survived. And we were lucky enough to find in the National Archives a really great collection of black and white photos, which documented um, the principal rooms inside the lodge and highlighted some of the furniture. And in this image in the entrance hall, where Sonia is ensconced for the evening, <laughs> um, you can see some Jacobethan, we call them chairs, um, in the hallway. These were designed and made for the lodge. And one of those is now in the National Museum of Australia, and we borrowed that for the exhibition. And you can see a long case clock there, which was supplied to the lodge um, as part of Ruth's project made by Ackmans. And uh, it had been banished to the um, store out of Queenbeam, where some of Ruth's furniture had ended up. Um, apparently, Mrs. Menzies complained that the clock chimed at night time and kept them awake. So that clock was removed during their occupation. Um, there were uh, lots of other images of the interiors. Um, and in the next slide, um, you can see the Prime Minister's study photographed in 1927. It was very much um, a men's club style of room with the desk that's still um, the Prime Minister's desk today, although um, the one that's used um, in preference is another item from the funds collection, but the, the original desk survives, as do some of the comfortable chairs and one of which you can see in this image. So these photos were incredibly useful not just in terms of identifying um, the furniture, but also understanding uh, the panelling, the relationship between the panel wall treatment and um, the plaster work. Um, we got some idea of the contrast between colours that were being used. And all of this started to build up a collection of knowledge about how the, the, the lodge looked and functioned um, from 1927. In the next slide, um, I've put in um, an image of some of the things that had changed over time as different prime minister's wives came and went. Um, they brought with them in interior design um, schemes of their own choosing. And that was partly why a lot of the Ruth Lane pool furniture had been relegated to store because it was considered to be rather old fashioned. And on the left hand side image from Vogue living in 1967, we see Zara Holt's brown room as it was very um, respectfully called in those days. 
um, not much of her furnishing um, had survived. There were a few uh, faded blackamoors out at the store, um, lots of things with gilt and excessive ornament on them, and a box of plastic chandeliers, which you can see hanging um, in this room. So there was sort of vestigial um, evidence of not just hers, but some of the earlier schemes. But on the right-hand side, uh, you can see the same room in 1986 when we finished um, some of the restoration work. And included in that was restoring a lot of the furniture. And you will see those the same chairs that were in the Prime Minister's study covered in leather, now introduced into um, the sitting room. And the bookcases in the Zara Holt um, picture removed the very heavy dark drapes also gone and the French doors leading out onto the loggia opened up and a really great sense of light and space um, introduced in, into that room. Um, so in the next slide, um, I've included the Rojo bookcase, which the fund purchased as part of the contribution towards the 1927 um, scheme being returned. This was made by the firm of CF Rojo, Rojo in Melbourne in around 1927. Um, it was not original to the lodge, but original of the period and the look um, of, of the time. And um, that was acquired as part of that previous room that I showed uh, to you. It featured very elaborately figured um, Italian walnut panels and um, was made, as I said, by CF Rojo, uh, one of the suppliers of furniture to the lodge at the time Ruth was working. So in the next slide, um, we meet Ruth Lane Poole. She was born Ruth Pollockson in um, Limerick in Ireland in 1885 and she was the daughter of a, um, a family who were very successful in um, the shipping business. This watercolor was painted by one of her friends, Beatrice Elvery, who was a member of the Irish um, sort of Celtic revival circle and was obviously a very close and long time friend of hers. It's a charming picture owned by the family and for the first time, uh, I got to see some images of Ruth as a young person, which um, were really beautiful and charming. By 1900, her parents' marriage had failed. And unusually for the time, um, Ruth became a ward uh, of her cousin. Um, her mother's sister uh, had taken um, Ruth on, but she died in 1900 when the family were living in London. And Ruth became the ward of one of her older cousins. So in the next slide, I thought I'd just introduce the family that she went to, um, to live with because they're really significant people. Um, Ruth's mother, was the sister of Susan Mary Yates, you can see in the top right hand image. And she was married to John Butler Yates, who trained as a lawyer, but became a very successful artist, um, particularly in portraiture. Um, he didn't stay around very long after Mary uh, died, uh, after Susan died and went to live in the United States, but his collection of portraits significant in many galleries in um, the UK and in America. So they had four children, uh, six children, sorry, four of whom are, are prominent in Ruth's story. The youngest one was Susan Mary Yates, whose nickname was Lily and is pretty well always referred to as Lily Yates, who was an embroiderer. And I'll speak a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, her brother, William Butler Yates, 
Um, he was an Irish poet, dramatist and writer and one of the foremost literary figures of the 20th century in Ireland. Um, he was a driving influence in the foundation of the um, Irish literary revival. He became elected to the Irish Senate in 1922 and he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1923. His sister, Elizabeth Corbett, who was known as Lolly Yates, was a publisher, an artist, and a very successful printer and engraver. Um, both Lily and Lolly were devotees of the English arts and crafts movement, and that influenced a lot of their approach to um, the arts. And the brother, Jack Butler Yeats, is considered to be Ireland's most famous artist. Um, he produced um, oils and lots and lots of woodcuts and book illustrations illustrating Irish country life. And in 1924, he was awarded a silver Olympic medal at the Paris Olympic Games for a painting he exhibited called the Liffey Swim which was a famous swimming race in Dublin's rivers. So you can see that the, the four cousins had uh, an amazing um, artistic uh, appreciation. And it was into this environment that Ruth um, really came and developed uh, a lot of her skills. I think it was really Lily who had the biggest impact um, on Ruth. And in the next slide um, are examples of some of the embroidery that um, uh, Lily had um, been trained in producing. Lily had worked uh, as an apprentice embroiderer to Mae Morris. And in this beautiful pre-Raphaelite looking photograph of her in the 1890s, um, we can see her very much as part of that arts and crafts um, milieu. And on the right hand side is one of her embroideries um, and the delicacy and um, the really painterly effect of her embroidery um, is, is so skillful. And um, to be trained by somebody like her of that standard and the influence of William Morris, I think was significant to Lily and something that she passed on to, to Ruth. And in the next slide are a couple of examples of Ruth's, oh, no, we're not there yet. <laughs> um, just back to Lily. Uh, Lily and Lottie um, and a woman called Evelyn Gleason um, established when the family went back to Ireland, done email industries, which was a, an attempt to revive traditional Irish crafts and train young women in um, keeping these, the skills alive. And you can see sitting around the table some of these young women that are being trained in embroidery. And the seagull curtain in the background is among the items that one of Ruth's daughters presented to um, the National Gallery of Ireland representing um, some of Lily and Ruth's um, skills in embroidery. In the next slide are examples of Ruth's embroidery. Uh, I was thrilled when um, Susie Murdoch brought out a selection of this work by Ruth, which included um, a lovely bedspread um, embroidered almost with um, medieval uh, motifs in blue, um, as you can see. The framed image on the bottom uh, left is a copy of a very famous embroidery that Lily um, made. Um, and I think that Ruth learnt her skill from copying and being taught by Lily in the, the sort of fine art of embroidery. And on the right hand side is the cover of a needle case, um, which Ruth also embroidered. So in the next slide, um, I've included Lily's sister, Lolly. 
who was a very accomplished artist in her own right. And she produced an, a series of almost textbooks um, as an art educator that taught people the importance of drawing from nature. And her illustrations are really quite beautiful uh, and are accompanied by uh, quite useful notes about the observations of different plants, leaves and um, flowers. And uh, her influence, like Lily's, I think was profound on Ruth herself. So in the next slide, um, we see here Lolly at the printing press in Dun Inor Industries, um, which operated its own press, uh, hand printing um, manuscripts and books and um, prints um, for you know, sort of framing and decoration. And she had been inspired to take this particular craft up by time spent um, at Kelmscott Press, where she was friendly with one of Morris's protégés. And um, she trained at a, a, a printing sort of workshop and, and school uh, in the fine art of, of printing. So she was a very, very competent um, engraver and printer uh, in her own right. And um, that um, industry developed and later became um, Koala Press and produced many, many um, of the woodcut illustrations um, that used, were used to illustrate books throughout um, the 20th century. In the uh, next image, I thought this was rather sweet. I found this amongst some of the, um, the research papers in the National Gallery in Ireland. And it says, decorate your house with dun emor, tufted rugs, embroidered portieres and sofa backs. Put dun emor tapestries on your walls and dun emor books in your bookcases. This is the duty of an Irish woman. And in the next slide, uh, some examples of the work of Jack Butler Yates, uh, whose woodcuts um, Lily, uh, Lolly had printed um, on her presses uh, for illustrations in books, but also as prints that were sold. And one of those that in the top right hand corner um, called the postcard is one that was purchased uh, by Ruth for display in the lodge in 1927. In the next slide, um, we meet Charles Langpool. Sometime around the time that the Yates family and Ruth moved to Dublin, uh, Ruth met this young man, Charles. He was a student then studying at St. Columbus College in um, Dublin where his father had been appointed to um, the Professor of Arabic Studies at Trinity College. In the next slide, we meet some of the Lane Pool family. The Lane Pools were uh, also like the Yates, a fascinating um, uh, family to have been associated with. Richard James Lane was an engraver, an artist, um, very successful. He um, produced a, um, an image of his great uncle, Edward William Lane, who was, um, sorry, the sister, uh, the, the brother of Sophia Lane. Um, Edward William Lane was an Arabic scholar. He spent a lot of time in Cairo and Egypt and wrote um, profusely on um, Arabic customs. He's often referred to as an Orientalist, like his sister Sophia, who moved to Cairo to be with him. And in references that I've read about her, she um, used to dress up in traditional um, Arabic clothing and mingle with the local population to get 
information that Edward, her brother, would use in some of his publications. Charles's father, um, oh, uncle, sorry, was a um, Re Reginald was an archaeologist and a numismatist, and he worked at the British Museum for many years. He actually lived on site um, at the British Museum and catalogued um, a large number of um, his collection. And on the final uh, right hand side is Stanley Lane Poole, also an Arabic scholar who was Charles' father. You see Charles um, in the row below um, as a forester. Um, and his brother, Richard Owen Langpool, who was a vice admiral, who was for a time um, in charge of the Naval uh, College at um, Jarvis Bay. So he had an Australian connection as well. He also served in the South Pacific um, during World War II. Next slide, please. So Ruth, and Charles maintained a long distance relationship. Charles had been intending to study uh, engineering, but he lost his left arm in, or part of his left arm in a shooting accident and gave the engineering course away and instead went to Nancy in France where he attended a school of forestry, a very prestigious school of forestry. And that was a significant and profound influence on the way he managed um, the whole um, aspect of forestry and reforestation um, in his future work. Um, to further his career, he um, took up positions with the British Colonial Service, which sent him um, for practical forestry training to the Cape Colony, the Transvaal and Sierra Leone. And through that uh, lengthy um, time apart, they maintained a correspondence and a relationship, which ended in the marriage in 1911. And you can see Ruth and Charles just to the left of the centre in the wedding photo group uh, outside Columbus, St. Columbus Chapel. Next slide, please. Charles. After their marriage, Charles returned to Sierra Leone as the conservator of forests, um, but it was decided that it was no place for a young woman. So Ruth stayed at home um, with uh, Lily and for a time uh, rented uh, a cottage called Manor Hill Farm in Gloucestershire. And it was there that her first child, Charlotte, was born. And the image of that house is very much like an arts and crafts um, style of architecture. So uh, that influence permeates through um, her life. In the next slide, um, I just wanted to mention a little bit about Charles. Um, he traveled widely, uh, assisting communities in Africa, across Africa, with um, methods to replace um, plantations of trees that had been um, decimated um, for timber production. And he was, he was called by John um, de Garville a, a conservator of forests. And that really was his philosophy, that in, in the forest industry, it was just as important to um, replace trees and nurture them as it was to use them in milling and logging and so on. He made some very influential friends and in, our, in the first of the series of presentations for um, the Narratives of Nations, Jennifer Sanders spoke about Sir Ronald Crawford Munro Ferguson, the sixth Governor General of Australia and his love for timber. Charles met him um, in the Imperial Con Conference Forestry Circles and Munro Ferguson was a really great supporter of Charles and it was through him that Charles eventually came to Australia to work. Uh, another very influential friend throughout Charles's career was Russell Grimwade, who's in the photo on the right. 
and he agitated um, strongly for a school of forestry to be established in Australia. So between the two of them, they really promoted Charles and his career here in Australia. In the next slide. In 2018, Jennifer and I attended the Royal Collection Studies course in London. And I found there among their vast collection of artifacts, a small timber box. And to my delight, I discovered that it had been designed by Ruth Lane Poole. And it had been given to Prince Edward, the Prince of Wales, when he visited Western Australia in 1920. And it's quite significant as a gift. It was designed to showcase uh, Western Australian timbers uh, and not just the box and the casket sort of um, uh, container, but also inside the little pieces of timber with their botanical names that slotted into the spaces inside. The gold coat of arms of Western Australia was um, produced in Western Australian gold. There was a lovely little swan finial that sat on top of the box, which had sadly sort of come apart in the process of being moved to Bristol. Um, and a key that was set with pearls that had been donated by the pearling industry. So it had combined a lot of the um, natural products of Western Australia as in the gift that she had, had designed. We were hoping to borrow it for the exhibition, but the cost of bringing it out, unfortunately, was prohibitive. And as it turned out, um, almost nobody would have seen it anyway. So, but I wanted to include that slide um, to acknowledge that as one of the earliest works that we know um, Ruth had a hand in. So Charles had come out to Western Australia. He had taken up a job advising the government um, at this time. Things didn't go very well. Uh, the timber industry found fault with Charles's approach and the government um, for economic reasons su supported the industry rather than the conservation aspects. And uh, in the end, um, it uh, led to Charles resigning. Ruth going back to England with, um, by then they had two children and Charles took up a job in Papua New Guinea and it would be some years before they um, joined each other and this time it was in returning to Australia where Charles uh, became the Commonwealth's advisor on forests. Um, they lived in Melbourne from 1925 and it was the first time that really in their marriage, um, they were able to um, spend uh, time together as a family and build their lives. So while Charles was busy um, advising the Commonwealth on forests, Ruth was um, becoming uh, very well accepted in Melbourne society. She had a very privileged entree no doubt uh, helped by her Yates connections. Um, she came to the attention of people uh, quite early on in, the in 1925 with an exhibition that she contributed to the Victorian Society of Arts and Crafts, where she made a model wound display. And it was obviously a very superior presentation, which was compared very favorably against some very unfavorable commentary of somebody who had put uh, an exhibition together that was basically um, a bit of an old tin shed and um, a very rural sort of approach to uh, home decorating. And um, Ruth certainly came out of that particular exercise very well. The exhibition was opened by Mrs. Ethel Bruce and she became a friend of Ruth's um, along with some very influential people, uh, including artists like Ethel Spowers, Thea Proctor, Margaret Preston, Adrian Faint, and the noted architect, Harold Desborough O'Neill. She was um, appointed by a, the Australian Home Builder as a correspondent um, in recognition of her uh, expertise uh, as 
it was considered in from the exhibition that she had contributed to. And in the next um, image, I think it's a cover of the, um, the Australian Home Builder and a little article that I think is very telling about uh, Ruth's philosophy, which is basically that um, men, may, the, a man's job is to make the building uh, of, a home, of a house, but it's the woman's job to make that house a home. And it's a philosophy that she carried through all of her work uh, at a time when um, there was no interior decorating training as we know it as today. And her advice was really built on practical um, observations and information that she dispensed with um, often very witty comments uh, to women, encouraging them to uh, use their skills to and local products to make a home. She wrote very acidly about uh, the inherited ugly atrocities, urging everybody to throw out um, that which was not attractive or had no function or purpose and uh, to embark on beautifying a home with things that people loved and, and simply um, loved. She then, um, when Australian Home Builder in the next slide um, became Australian Home Beautiful, Ruth continued along with Nora Cooper and Edna Walling and a number of other well-known people to contribute articles. Um, the cover of this particular issue is amusing, uh, even more so the illustrations inside it, as Ruth gives advice on how to decorate your table for Christmas. She wrote on flower arranging, on how to furnish um, your house with the right and appropriate light fittings for the different types of rooms, um, sort of chairs based on uh, traditional styles, uh, well known as um, you know the cabinet makers of the 18th century and her articles gave advice on how to make cushions and curtains and a lot of practical information uh, at a time when table talk and the home magazines uh, catered much more for uh, the, the sort of social interest um, in life um, rather than practical advice. And I think the cover of the Home Beautiful in this image says it well. It, it's, um, it goes from how to mix and lay concrete to decorating your Christmas table. So she did everything in between um, to help uh, home furnishers, as she liked to call herself. Uh, in the next slide, and I should mention just before um, I talk about this particular image, that one of the forthcoming lectures um, in this series is by Katrina Quinn, and she will be talking about the, um, the sort of move movement um, in interior furnishing and decorating as a, uh, a sort of industry, um, and the the sort of professionalism um, of it as a career and the modernist um, influence, which Ruth uh, stayed well away from. She was very heavily into copying from um, historical period styles. Some of her articles are illustrated by Ethel Spowers. And these two images are from an article she wrote about how to organize your laundry. Um, and uh, you can see the laundry cupboard well set out there with its um, markings of um, the different contents of a successful uh, linen cupboard. And the lady on the left um, doing beautiful embroidery um, on the linen for, for, for the home. So in 19, late 1925, in the next slide, Sir John Butters, who headed up the Australian, uh, the Federal Capital Commission, which was the uh, um, government 
uh, authority charged with getting Canberra ready for the opening of the new federal parliament, but also as a town to accommodate public servants. So he had a pretty responsible job um, and was the person uh, along with Henry Rowland, who Ruth had the most contact with when she was eventually appointed. And her appointment came about, and in the next slide I'll explain uh, that the original intention was to uh, construct official residences uh, in Walter Burley Griffin's plan as part of the parliamentary triangle. And in the uh, little uh, detail of the map, you can see Capitol Hill, and on either side of Capitol Hill were to be the residence of the Governor General and the Prime Minister. But like so many schemes, um, and given the difficulties with the Walter Burley Griffin um, process in, in terms of um, fulfilling that, uh, though that plan was abandoned and alternative accommodation had to be found for, um, for the Governor General and the Prime Minister. So in the next slide, we see um, an early image of Yarralumna uh, or Government House, as it was. It had been acquired, it was part of a pastoral property and, and, and owned by very wealthy uh, landowners, the Campbell family. It um, had been acquired by the Commonwealth Government uh, in anticipation that they would be needing um, alternative accommodation and also for the land and, and the environment um, on which it, it sort of stood. So they had this house already and uh, that was designated to be the house for the residence for the Governor General. Um, in another part of Canberra, in the next slide, uh, the Federal Capital Commission had engaged Oakley and Parks, a Melbourne firm of architects, to uh, come up with some housing schemes to um, establish a suburb called Blandfordia, which we now know as Forest. And these fairly simple um, resident, um, residents that they were um, building were to house um, senior public servants. And they, um, they were fairly basic uh, and modest houses, many of them built in that sort of Spanish mission or Italian villa style. And you can see those homes. Unfortunately, um, around forests, they're being um, pulled down and, and big modern um, buildings going up. And so they're becoming a, a, a little bit rare. But that scale uh, and the size of those houses very much distinguished that part of Canberra. So in the next slide. Um, Ruth was um, engaged um, on a fairly meagre salary. Her job was to work with the architects and her domain was the inside of the properties and she was given a fairly free reign. Uh, she ran foul of John Butters fairly early on because the budget um, that she had been allocated she considered was way too low and she basically threatened to walk off the job um, and he was getting a bit desperate and acceded to her uh, demands for uh, a, a higher budget um, for both the properties. So she had a fairly um, a reasonable relationship with both the architects on the two residences. Um, she was demanding some of the changes that she made to make the house more livable. But in the end, I think they were able to um, respect each other and, um, and come up with um, a satisfactory solution. So the architect she worked with on Government House was John Smith Murdoch, with the architect for the new, new Parliament House building in Canberra that was to open in 1927. And you can see here in contrast to the earlier image with the uh, creeper growing over the building, 
that he made a real attempt to try and unify a series of sort of cottages and extensions. And certainly on the left-hand part of Government House um, will be familiar to people today. Um, the uh, section on the right has been significantly modified and another story so in the next slide, we have a little sense of one of the interiors that we've produced for Government House. This is the entrance hall. And she wrote about her approach to this, saying that uh, it had to be of a sufficient standing um, and um, appropriateness to entertain and welcome dignitaries and official visitors. And so here we see um, lavish wall decoration using uh, wallpaper from Sanderson's and tapestries, which um, she had woven specifically for these jobs. Many of the furnishings um, in the textile area she ordered from major uh, firms in London. Uh, the furniture was mostly made here in Australia. And here we see more of the Jacobethan style of furniture um, in the hall table and the, the hall chairs. Um, in the next slide, um, we see some of the drawings that Ruth organised. They're not her drawings. She had employed somebody to actually do the drawings herself but her signature and approval is written, handwritten on each of them. And these sketches that were drawn uh, are fascinating. They're in the collection of the National Library of Australia. And they tell us a little bit, not just about the, uh, the actual uh, dimensions, but about a little bit about the construction, the sort of upholstery, and many of them specify that the furniture is to be wax finished to show off the beauty of the timber. Her preference was very much for Queensland maple and she loved the honey color of that timber when it was polished. And so much of the furniture that um, is in the houses is made of Queensland maple. Um, in the next image, um, we just see here uh, a reference to the work of George Hebblewhite, who was one of the cabinet makers that she preferred um, and you can see how closely the design of the chair uh, that she produced for manufacture by one of the many firms she used in Melbourne, which included Rock and Company, Roho, and a number of other uh, well-known firms who produced the furniture. And on the right-hand side is a picture of the chair as finished in 1927. And in the next image, this is the drawing room at Government House, and you can see here uh, that furniture, some of that furniture in situ. Ruth went to great pains to explain the need for the houses to work in an official capacity, but also as family rooms. And she was very conscious that the scale of their decoration really had to work at both ends of the spectrum. And in her interior, she creates a very homely um, sort of look and feel, um, but also um, appropriate for the job that they had to do. Um, in the next slide, um, I just wanted to mention about the um, furniture that she, um, she designed. Uh, this is the desk that, that she designed for the Governor General. And in the next slide, there's an image of the, um, the Governor General's desk in 1927 in situ. Um, in the next illustration, uh, the chairs that she designed for the dining room, and you can see in the top left-hand corner, an embossed crown, uh, which was stamped into the buffalo hide that, um, that she used as the upholstery for the furniture. In the next image, uh, you can see some of those chairs in the smaller informal dining room, wood panelled again in Tasmanian oak and blackwood, um, and the chairs um, 
that be eventually became the sweet. And I think in the next slide, you can see um, those chairs with modern copies to um, match up and extend the seating in Government House. I'm conscious that I'm only about halfway through um, this talk. So um, if people need to go, I understand. Um, for the tableware in the next slide, Ruth chose uh, Wedgwood for the gold crested china. And she contacted firms in Sheffield to uh, get moulds of traditional Georgian silver, which she had made um, on commission through Hardy Brothers in Melbourne. Um, and most of that silver continues to be used in Government House today. Perhaps Ruth's greatest achievement in the next slide was the execution at very short notice of the furnishing of the suites for the Duke and Duchess of York for their visit to open federal parliament. And in this slide here, you can see that she's put the imperial crown in the center of the bedhead for the Duchess's bedroom. I think if I have a favorite piece in um, of Ruth's work, it's in Government House. And in the next slide, uh, there's a drawing of the settee, very much in the arts and crafts style. In the next slide um, is the actual settee, uh, which was shown in the exhibition, made of Queensland maple by um, WH Rockman Company, which uh, I know that Andrew Man Matt Montana will be talking to us about in the forthcoming uh, lecture series. And I love this chair, because this settee, because it shows uh, a real um, skill in translating the sort of philosophy of the arts and crafts movement and the beauty of nature and the natural um, sort of elements of, you know, in this case, tree forms um, as the support for the city. Meanwhile, over in um, Blandfordia uh, and Red Hill, in the next slide, Oakling Parks were very busy um, building houses uh, as per the design we saw earlier. And this is Calthorpe's house, which is located in Red Hill. It was built for Harry Calthorpe, a very successful stock and station agent and his fashionable wife, Della. And if you're interested in seeing a preserved 1927 interior uh, house and garden intact because they kept everything um, as it was as a family, um, a visit there is really well worthwhile and there are lots of similarities in the house and its furnishing with the lodge. Um, in the next slide, you, we can see that the lodge is slightly grander. It's um, double storey um, and set in quite expansive um, parkland setting. And even though it looks a, a little grand there, it was quite modest in size and again, furnished so that a family and official entertainment could be undertaken. In the next slide is a photo of the lodge, um, part, almost completed with the loggia beside it. So it, it really has a, a style that combines the um, Spanish mission of West Coast America with um, Italianate in influences in it. And um, that loggia is still there today and used. Uh, extensively. In the next slide is uh, the drawing room, uh, now known as the morning room of the lodge in 1927. The Beal piano is in the corner. We can see a Hans Heysen over the fireplace. There's a George Bell hanging near the lampshade. And again, the furnishing is quite modest. Um, timber panelling is used again there. Um, and she added the uh, I think in the next slide, um, quite a lot of prints by fashionable artists of the day, including Margaret Preston, Adrian Faint, and Thea Proctor. In the next slide are the beautiful chairs that were designed for the Prime Minister's dining room, carved in the back splat with the PM monogram that are probably her most recognizable uh, works. And these, some of these, one of these was included in the exhibition as well. Uh, she specified that they were furnished in buffalo hide and um, they look very much today as they did when, um, when she produced those for the lodge. 
Um, another item that she um, added to the room in the next slide is this uh, design of a Sheraton style sideboard. And in the next slide, you can see that still in use in the dining room at the lodge today. For the lodge's tableware in the next slide, she marked everything with PM's monogram. And um, again, all of this was supplied from uh, English ceramic firms and um, cutleries, cutlers from Sheffield. Um, she had been told to buy Australian made wherever possible, but uh, of course the tablewares were the one thing that um, she really had to import. Um, and these were made specifically through a commission with, um, that Hardy Brothers um, managed. So in the next slide, Ruth travelled to Canberra for a few weeks before the official opening to make sure that everything had been uh, delivered and arranged to her satisfaction. And she was rewarded with an invitation to um, some of the celebrations associated with the opening of Parliament. Um, the last item to arrive, which she picked up um, from the ship um, that docked in Melbourne, uh, that delivered a bedspread that Lily Yates had made for the, um, it was bedspread for the Duchess of York's um, bed and very elaborately embroidered. So while Ruth was busy furnishing, Charles in the next slide was preparing for the establishment of the School of Forestry in Canberra. This building survives today. It's now um, owned by CSIRO. And you can see flying above the building, a flag which was designed and embroidered by Ruth. And that flag was in the collection of the ANU and uh, again was lent for the exhibition. In the next slide, um, we can see the interior of the entrance hall to the School of Forestry. And again, timber panelling, use of Australian timbers in the floor and furniture that interestingly enough, was designed by Ruth, but not specifically for the entrance hall. It seems that uh, orders were placed with the suppliers subsequent to the, the manufacture of the furnishing, uh, furniture for the lodge um, to furnish this building um, and all made in Australian timbers, of course. She was very proud that in both residences, there wasn't one stick of furniture that was not made of Australian timber. So in the next slide, um, we see here Charles, uh, not Charles, one of his uh, colleagues, uh, manufacturing um, skis. Charles and his family were very competent skiers. He founded the Canberra Alpine Lodge and was its president along with May Casey and, and Richard Casey as vice presidents um, and built the lodge in Canberra. But as a student project, he encouraged his students to make pairs of skis out of Australian hardwoods. And on the right hand side are some samples from the ANU's timber collection, which was established um, by Charles Langpool in 1927. And um, these would have been the samples that the students would have uh, used to learn the properties of Australian timbers. Uh, in the next slide, um, we'll probably have to run through these pretty quickly, Sonia. Um, the uh, opening of the uh, School of Forestry and in the next, you can see Charles and um, Ruth were in, on the right-hand side there. And here they are being presented to Sir Isaac Isaacs and Lady Isaacs at Government House. And Ruth um, looking, as always, extremely glamorous. Um, and a very fashionable uh, person. Uh, she was very popular in society as the commentary in the social pages attests. Um, so in the next slide, um, I've included uh, an image from the Art Gallery of New South Wales of Sir Harold Desborough Anir, who was the architect that um, they, the Lane Pools were very friendly with. Uh, he uh, designed a house and in the right hand side you can see uh, a, a print by Napier Waller and when you look at the next slide you can see the similarity in the style of Westridge House which sits next to the School of Forestry. Charles Langpool um, put up a mighty um, argument 
not to have to live in one of the public servant houses and persuaded the um, commission to get De Harold Desborough O'Neill to design a suitable residence for him and his family. And Edna Walling did a landscape plan for the garden, which in essence, um, they followed with a little bit of variation. They were both very keen gardeners and established a large um, picking garden and fruit orchard around the house. And it was obviously a great place for the girls to grow up. So in the next slide, um, Ruth uh, finished her job at um, in the furnishing of the official residences and was then appointed by Maya in Melbourne to advise people on furnishing. And Harold Desborough O'Neill set up some mini um, suites of rooms in the store which Ruth furnished and um, would be on hand to give practical advice to homemakers. Um, and she kept that job until they made the permanent move to Canberra for Charles's work at the School of Forestry. So uh, you can see in this uh, pairing of slides, one from the front cover of Australian Home Beautiful in 1925, and the other of the drawing room or the morning room as it's known now of the lodge. And the similarities are very obvious and it goes to the heart of one of the, the observations that I think is really important, which is that Ruth didn't stand on ceremony. She designed uh, the residences for the Governor General and the Prime Minister, as she would for um, any member of um, the Australian um, population who wanted a home in sort of 19 fashionable, 1920s fashionable style. Uh, and I think that's a really significant finding out of all of this research that um, she didn't go over the top in terms of providing um, interior furnishings um, and, and wasn't seduced by the, um, the sort of prestige of the task. Um, so my research has not stopped at this point. It's continuing and I'll just very quickly go through the last of the, the, the slides, which um, shows some really interesting aspects that have come out of the research that I've been doing. Um, this was an advertisement I found in one of the issues of Australian Home Furniture advertising um, a suite of furniture for sale. That furniture exists and I know where it is and it's um, uh, well, um, and well appreciated and loved by one of Ruth's um, grandchildren. Um, but there are more things in this photo uh, that uh, lead the research in other directions. I'd like you to look at not just the ladder back chairs, but also the image um, above the sideboard, which is a, um, an illustration by Christine Angus, the second wife of Walter Sickett. And next to it is a drawing of Jack Yates. I'd seen similar chairs to these before in the next slide at Government House and in Charles Lane Poole's office in a photo that was taken um, in the 1930s. So in the next slide, you can see the ladder back chair that he's sitting up there. So that was interesting. And then I came across when I met with Ruth's family in the next slide, uh, a drawing that, or a watercolour that Ruth had done. And there is the Christine Angus painting um, that we saw in the advertisement. And here it's beautifully illustrated in colour. Um, and this was um, done by Ruth when she was staying at Manor Hall Farm in Gloucestershire. Uh, in the next slide, we see that same image in their flat in Cottesloe in Perth. And I started to think that perhaps there was something more to Ruth's articles than I had first thought. When I went to visit Susie Murdoch's place um, in Queensland, she showed me Ruth's writing desk, and that's in the next slide. And I recognised her writing desk from an article that Ruth had written about um, study furniture. And 
um, the idea of um, a wife having a space of her own and a bit of area where she could attend to her own things. And when I look closely at the um, this image after seeing uh, some of the family items, I realised that the portraits above the desk were of Jack Butler Yates, um, Ruth's uncle, Lily next to her, and Lolly on the um, on the right. And I started to realise that the setting for Ruth's articles was indeed her home or her flat in Punt Hill and that she illustrated her articles with her own furniture um, and largely talked about that. So she was living uh, the advice that she was giving out. But the final proof that this was indeed the case was that in the next slide, just look at the photo on the top of the, um, the, the desk itself, which is a photo, sorry, that photo there. In the next slide, it's a a beautiful watercolour of Ruth's three daughters painted by Beatrice Elfrey. And that was the, the final um, confirmation that Ruth had used her own house or her own flat and furnishings to illustrate so many of her articles. So I'm just going to finish by um, putting some links that I know Sonia will be able to share with anyone who's interested. If you want to know more about the Australiana Fund, there's a link to the website. The Canberra Museum and Gallery very, very generously photographed the whole exhibition and put it up online. So if you go onto their website and look at their past exhibitions, you'll be able to see the exhibition um, as it was presented in, in the gallery in Canberra. And I've included the reference to Trove, which has digitised the copies of the Australian Home Beautiful from which I've drawn largely um, a lot of this lecture. And finally, for the, the survivors of this long talk, um, I'd just like to mention that the Australiana Fund has copies of the catalogue for sale. Um, Sonia tells me that it's $15 for the copy and $5 for the postage. And some of the illustrations that I've shown tonight but many more are included in the catalogue and some essays by um, a number of people talking about Ruth and um, Jennifer has also included a, an article about the um, timber uh, wood library that has been acquired by the fund and is displayed at Government House. So that ends the talk. I'm very sorry it went so way over time, but I think oh. you'll agree Ruth has is a fascinating person and a woman of influence. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I'm just astounded by how much more you found out about Ruth since you wrote about Ruth Laidpool in the Fund's book, Collecting for the Nation, where you did the chapter on the lodge and also a lovely essay on Ruth Laidpool. And I remember you saying then, I think there's more to this story hence the exhibition, I still think there's a book, like a really beautiful book, all those illustrations, and the links back to the Irish, not only the families, but the influential people in Ireland that Ruth was associated and related to. Um, the threads are just extraordinary. So thank you very much. I mean, you summed it up again, a woman of influence, but... Um, combined with the influential Charles Lane Poole, they were clearly a, um, not a force to be reckoned with because they were highly civilised couple who had a big effect in Australia. And I'd now like to ask if anyone has questions, um, perhaps before we see what comes up. I don't know if it's easy to say what most inspires you about Ruth but uh, is there some aspect of her work? I think for me, because of my passion for Australian flora and uh, Australian timber, I am knocked out by the fact that she went against the trend um, on a number of, uh, in a number of areas. She refused to look at furniture as suites of furniture. She liked to mix and match 
historical period styles. Um, and I think she did that very successfully without it looking um, confused and awkward. But also, I think that link with Charles, and I call them a power couple because I think they really were. Mm. Um, I think that uh, she applied his passion for Australian timber into the work that she was able to create um, in the furniture that she commissioned and gave Australian timber, which had been fashionable as colonial furniture, but perhaps had declined in popularity, um, a whole new respect. And for me, I think that's, that's a really inspiring thing. And the fact that she was a woman doing an amazing job at a time when uh, career women didn't really have that profession. And uh, it was just a combination of very good fortune that the circle of friends that she <coughs> ended up belonging to in Melbourne uh, led to her appointment um, as, as the furnisher um, for the Commonwealth. And it's sad that she didn't work after that. I think in part, she was bruised by some of the negotiations with the, um, the bureaucracy, but I think she felt it was time to spend time supporting her husband and, of course, raising her three children, who were very much part of Canberra life. And, um, and you could do a whole lecture on the three girls because they themselves are fascinating uh, in their own right. Yes, I could understand that with parents like yes. Charles and Ruth. Yes. Uh, so here are the, the questions that have come up in the chat room. That... There, there are a few comments. So um, firstly, Catriona Quinn, who is one of our speakers um, in a lecture going forward. Um, she's commented, Margaret, the Holt interiors she believes were by Reg Riddle and Marion Hall Best, or those are a Holt takes credit in the Vogue Living article. Yeah. Um, um, she has also gone on to say, totally absorbing Margaret and a side to interwar design that is often overlooked. Um, she recommends, if anyone's interested, she recommends Deborah Sugg Ryan's book, Ideal Homes, 1918 to 1939, um, if anyone wants to know more about the subject. Um, Harriet Elvin, um, former CEO of Cultural Facilities um, in Canberra, um, had to leave the lecture early, unfortunately, but she said she's so sorry to, to have to leave. She's really enjoyed the lecture. Um, and so grateful for your inspired curation of the Ruth Lane Pool exhibition at CMAG. Sadly, you were never able to see it, but she can assure you it was testament to your skillful research and, of course, has a continuing life online. Best wishes, Harriet. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's a comment that's come up from Sheridan Burke to everyone. A wonderful lecture. Thank you, Margaret. And mine's just faded, so oh, she's writing it, I think, as we speak. I don't know, Sonia, if you can see that. <laughs> anyway, she really liked it. <laughs> oh, that's good. Thank you, Sherry. Nice to know friends are in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> and Margaret, I, I just had a question, having yeah. worked a bit on cataloguing some of the lane pool at Government House myself. Um, how come sometimes a hyphen, sometimes not a hyphen? I don't. There doesn't it's, seem to be any consistency. <laughs> there's no consistency. And I went back through um, the family tree trying to find out whether there was a, a rule about this. And it was, it was unspecific um, through the generations. And it's really interesting that Charles Langpool used the hyphen, but Ruth didn't. And I have no idea why. But in her articles in Australian Home Beautiful, you will see that there is no hyphen. And yet on Charles's correspondence, he always uses the hyphen. And he pub he's published as Lane Pool with a hyphen. So there's something there that we have yet to unravel, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> there any other comments, Sonia, or queries? Um, Everybody just saying what a wonderful lecture and yeah. thanking you very much, Margaret. Um, when you were getting worried about overrunning, I was thinking, no, no, please continue. We'll stop. 
we're interested to hear all of it. Oh, well, it's lovely that so many people were able to stay. I, I mean, it was just very, very hard to know what to cut out. I could have made it two hours, I, I'm sure, <laughs> but maybe that's Part too long. Two. Part two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone, who's joined us for our second lecture. Um, Sonia was mentioning, actually, just before we started, that next year Canberra is 110 years old. So I think out of all of the, um, certainly from the Ruth and Charles Lane Pool, but also the funds rolling Canberra, there'll be some sort of function that we should be having in Canberra to make 110 years, uh, celebrate that. Um, when you think um, of the names involved, and Anne Watson will be talking early next year on Marion Marnie Griffin and her contribution to Canberra, particularly in terms of landscape. So I can see that there'll be an unfolding of information about Canberra, the people involved in designing it, in building it, and in people who really made it the um, national capital that it is. So on that note, uh, thank you, Margaret. I can't think of a better way to have got stuck into Ruth Lane Pool than listen to her life, her family, and her the power couple, as you say, that was Charles and Ruth. And thank you very much to all of Ruth's family who supported Margaret in her research and in the exhibition. It's just wonderful to see that the family is so attuned to the importance of Ruth and Charles in Australian history, really. So thank you very much. Thank you.